what are the political forces, what are the real interests that are keeping these weapons? That's the story that hasn't really been fleshed out. What does the debate look like? I have a profound concern, and I've just written a, written a serious uh, law review article on this, evidencing that the diplomats of the world have in good faith made serious commitments to move toward nuclear disarmament. But it's clear that in the interagency debates within their capitals, where other agencies other than the foreign ministries come to the table, those diplomats have lost the debate. And the, the commitments that they've made have not been fulfilled. The debate has been won by the, by the weapons establishments, by the military, by the small group within militaries that like nuclear weapons. Most, most military leaders don't like them. They're not weapons that can be used. They're very expensive and they're very dangerous. Um, so the, the real debate has not been opened up. And one of the reasons why I believe it's time to push for a convention eliminating nuclear weapons is that once that goal is set, then we can really seize the debate because then we have a goal. Right now, we're following a compass that keeps shifting around. So there's ad hocism in the approach. Without a clear goal, you can't criticize policies that move you away from that goal. A policy, for example, that would obviously move away from that goal would be the continued aspiration to weaponize space. The weaponization of space is based on a model of the pursuit of dominance. It's inconsistent with strategic stability. Strategic stability is necessary as we move forward to a nuclear weapons free world. But any policies in which any country seeks to have dominance of, 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 a, of a strategic weapon system is something that is going to disturb strategic stability. But if you don't have this goal, the galvanizing force and clarity of a goal that a convention would provide, it's very difficult to say this is a policy we should avoid. There are provincial toxic political dynamics that are still going on on many issues that are really quite serious across the board. We don't have a sufficiently serious enough uh, recognition of the need to get off of fossil fuels fast. We're burning, we're burning the climate of the planet up. We can't do that. What are we doing it for? Out of greed? Out of irresponsibility? We're stuck, we're stuck in an addiction to, uh, to, uh, to, to simply wrecking the ecosystem. Um, it's the same failure of a proper definition of security a proper definition of our common human interests uh, being overshadowed by provincialism. Our political institutions are, we have a failure of leadership in our political institutions to inform the public of how serious these threats are. And they're trying to, they're trying to solve them, but they're, they're not creating sufficient political will amongst the populace uh, to, to, have, you know, to have the kind of uh, serious, support that they need to fulfill, to fulfill, as President Obama said, the, the Prague vision of the peace and security of a nuclear weapons free world. They're not informing the public of this. And uh, people in America vote largely on the issues of taxes and sex. Uh, they don't vote on global issues. The polls show enormous support for a test ban treaty, enormous support for the universal elimination of nuclear weapons. I talk to people and I, I'll talk to a, a very, very conservative American audience and they know nothing about the threat that they face. But they do understand this. I will, I'll remind them that Richard Nixon uh, brought into force the Biological Weapons Convention. He led in making that happen. And imagine if he had said, we will have a treaty that will allow no country to use polio or smallpox as a weapon, but in the interest of international peace and security, we'll ensure that nine countries can use the plague as a weapon. Even Richard Nixon couldn't have sold the illogic of that. So he took the logical and reasonable route and said, we'll ban all biological weapons. They're taboo. Nuclear weapons are far more hazardous than the biological weapons. So we need to increase the taboo, the abhorrence, the horror of these devices, that they're absolutely morally unacceptable. That's why these moral arguments are so important. Because, they, because Richard Nixon could bring the Biological Weapons Convention into force because the moral condemnation of biological weapons was universally recognized. 
Another change, for example, was the Chemical Weapons Convention. The Chemical Weapons Convention was supported by the Chemical Manufacturers Association. It was largely negotiated during the time of, uh, the first of, of George Bush Sr. The chemical industry said, let's put a firewall here. We don't want our industry being used to make weapons of mass destruction. Now, to some extent, there was a geopolitical distortion in the thinking of American leadership, which at the time was biological and chemical weapons are poor, poor men's weapons of mass destruction. But now we know that nuclear weapons are similarly quite inexpensive to produce, especially as if, 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 the, if the nuclear materials are available. So the same logic of not allowing, uh, not, not allowing small fries to get these that led to the universal, non-discriminatory banning of biological and chemical weapons on both moral, ethical, geopolitical, and military reasons applies certainly to nuclear weapons. But we still have the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which has Russia in it, we have NATO, and which is funded, which has a robust budget. Do they have similar aspirations or do they have different aspirations? We have not resolved whether we can live in a world where there is just us or do we have to have an us and them. <laughs>